are thrilled to be hosting this event at Roosevelt this year. It's one way to make public the special relationship between Roosevelt University and the CTBA. Just over a year ago, we welcomed CTBA's Executive Director, Ralph Martiri, to the faculty as our Arthur Rubloff Professor of Public Policy. And at that time, we also began the process of affiliating the CTBA with Roosevelt because there's a powerful synergy between the missions of the two organizations. The CTBA, as you all know, and I'm sure can read in your packet, is committed to social and economic justice through data-driven public policy. And as many of you know, Roosevelt University also has a long, proud history of advancing social and economic justice. And we like data-driven public policy, too. Uh, the university, just for those of you who are less familiar with Roosevelt, was founded in 1945 by a courageous group of faculty who wanted to create a university free from discriminatory racial and religious college admission quotas of the day. It was hailed in its early days as a powerful democracy experiment. And to this day, Roosevelt remains dedicated to providing access to higher education for all academically qualified students and to celebrating and interrogating our democratic values through our annual American Dream Reconsidered Conference. We're proud of our social and intellectual heritage at the university, and I'm particularly proud of our growing relationship with the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability. It's a little bit deeper than just providing space and talking appreciatively about each other. Uh, we're building a strong relationship. CTBA staffers design curriculum, teach in our students and in our programs. We sponsor joint programming. And the thought leadership that happens in forums like these and in the CTBA's policy work helps to reinforce and advance the university's mission of promoting mutual understanding, inclusion, social consciousness, and action toward social justice. So it is a pleasure and a privilege to welcome you to the university today. And I would like to introduce the board chair of the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability, David May. Good morning. Thank you for attending our fiscal symposium 2019. Uh, the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability's Fiscal Symposium is held annually and focuses on various policy matters affecting the state of Illinois' budget and fiscal condition. I want to start with a few housekeeping matters. First, by thanking Bonnie, Julie Rowan, and Roosevelt University for their hospitality hosting this important and timely event this year. With special thanks to our platinum sponsor, Illinois Association of School Administrators. Also special thanks to our breakfast sponsor, the University Professionals of Illinois. Further thanks to CTBA's symposium host committee for their time and dedication to help make this event a success. If those committee members in, in attendance would please stand when your name is called. Jane Lehman, Marlies Trover, Bonnie Gunzenhauser, Julie Rowan, Tracy Schoenberger, and Sydney Smith. Thanks so much. Whether it's producing fact-based analysis about the fiscal crisis in Illinois, or handling the day-to-day behind-the-scenes operations of the organization, all of this could not be done without the expertise of CTBA staff. Please stand when your name is called. Research Director Drizel Fellew, Research Associate Allison Flanagan, Research Interns Eliana Young and Alexis Peterson, Pearson, Development Director Sydney Smith, and Administrative Director Tracy Schoenberger. Thanks so much to all of, all of you. CTB is grateful for the collaborative work with so many of whom are in, in attendance today to ensure Illinois policymakers and others are informed and able to support economic justice initiatives. But perhaps you are not aware that the CTBA does this very important work on a small budget, a very small budget. The CTBA is a 501c3 organization that relies on contributions from individuals and organizations such as yours. 
These contributions are especially important now as the state of Illinois continues to struggle to find solutions to its fiscal crisis. Donation cards are available uh, on the tables and please consider donating today. Thank you. And now please uh, welcome CTBA Executive Director and Roosevelt University Rubloff Professor of Public Policy, Ralph Martiri. Thanks, Rob. All right, good morning. So, first of all, I have to thank Bonnie and Roosevelt University. Isn't this just a wonderful place to be in a beautiful room? And, and a lot of times when we're going around the state talking about things like the progressive fair tax or pension reform, et cetera, we're not quite in such a nice room. So thank you very much for providing this. And at, as you think of questions, whether you're, you're hearing it in response to some of the data I'm gonna throw up on the screen there, or in response to our panelists' comments, please feel free to write them down and pass them to the end of the Aisle. We are going to collect them and bring them up here to be read. All right, so the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability has sort of an odd and ponderous sounding name, right? And it, and it appears as if, based on that name, what we really focus on is simply money matters, some kind of watchdog group, and sure we do that. But our mission, much like this university's mission, is about social and economic justice. And if you don't have an adequately and sustainably financed public sector, you cannot, in fact, have a society that creates access to opportunity for all on an equitable basis. Public systems, public structures, are crucial to creating access to opportunity. That's clear. So whenever we at CTBA are working on something like pension reform or tax reform, et cetera, it's all in context of the demands made on the public sector for it to provide core services and systems that actually have the capacity to create access to opportunity for everyone. So when we do our research, we frequently engage in something called systems analysis. Are these systems working the way they were intended to work to create such access to opportunity? Or are they, in fact, somehow flawed? And is that flaw manifesting itself in racial or ethnic or income-based disparities? And if you spend any time looking at any of the data, the inescapable answer is yes. And that's why, while you may be familiar with the center's work on things like education funding reform or pension reform, you may not be so familiar with our work on structural racism. Yet we have an entire research initiative devoted to that very specific topic because the data overwhelmingly tell us that public systems in our state and in our nation, in fact, in their application, not only fail to create access to opportunity for everyone as intended, but literally reinforce historic discrimination. So let's see what the data tell us, shall we? First of all, this looks like a little progress. This is achievement gaps in math and reading from 1965 to 2015. And you could see, and, and it's in years of a gap, in, in 1965, in math, the gap between blacks and whites was three years, and it has decreased to 2.6 years. The gap between whites and Latinos decreased a little from 1.9 to 1.8%. Same with reading. So you see a little progress, and you think maybe things are heading in the right direction. Well, first of all, that's not a lot of progress over an incredibly long period of time, number one. And number two, the data tell us unquestionably that most progress was being made in the early years of desegregation as we created more inclusive school districts from highly segregated school districts. And that work carried on in the 60s and 70s and into the 80s. 
The problem is, beginning in the 90s, our schools started to resegregate. And a lot of the closing of the gaps that we saw academically started to then open up. This is damning. Illinois is the fifth richest state in the richest nation in the world. We, as a nation, as a state, absolutely have the fiscal capacity to invest appropriately in ensuring every one of our children has access to a quality education irrespective of their race or income level or ethnicity, period. We have the capacity. But the data are telling us we're not doing it. And in fact, the data in Illinois very much tell us we are not doing it. So a couple of years ago, Illinois changed its school funding formula. And this is one of the achievements the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability, frankly, is most proud of in its career. We worked hard to shift from our old foundation formula approach to education funding to the new evidence-based model. That change overnight moved Illinois from having the least equitable and least adequate formula for funding education to literally the best practice in America. If we fully fund this evidence-based formula, what will happen is every school district will have the resources needed to put in place those practices which the research and or evidence indicate actually enhance student achievement. And they'll be able to put those practices in place predicated on the specific needs of the students they serve. The model automatically adjusts for your concentration of low-income children, your concentration of English learners, etc. That's the good news. The bad news is the legacy of where the old school form funding formula has left us. And here, you can see it's a very bad place indeed. How the model works. Each school district has a unique adequacy target of resources it needs to put in place these evidence-based practices. We decided to look at our state and say, okay, go to the bottom line there. What's the average gap in per-pupil funding faced by a student in Illinois that's attending an underfunded school? And the answer is $3,300 per kid, that bottom line. That's the average. How does that break down according to race? We wanted to ask that question. Once again, look at the data. Your average white student in an underfunded school faces a gap of $2,400 per pupil. Your average African-American student, 4,600. Your Afri average Latino student, 4,400. I don't know how you look at that data and don't say the old school funding system was structurally racist. Certainly it underfunded education overall. The first time the Illinois State Board of Education ran this model, it said, hey, we are $7.3 billion short of what the evidence indicates is needed. But that shortage isn't felt the same by all students. Think back to that national data on achievement gap. Illinois is not unique here. When I was honored to serve on the Federal Excellence and Equity in Education Commission, co-sponsored actually by Congressman Honda, who's one of our panelists today, we saw that that data was consistent in every state. Now, if you consistently underfund education overall, but you specifically single out ethnic groups or racial groups, for particularly poorly funded education, why should you expect anything other than disproportionate academic outcomes? This really isn't a chicken in the egg issue, right? If you have inadequate capacity on the front end, you will generate inadequate outcomes on the back end. Period, end of story, and so it is in Illinois. So here's our performance on the NAEP data the differential between races on those who meet or exceed standards. 42% of our white kids, 11% of our black kids, 
21% of our Hispanic kids, 39% of our mixed race kids. The data really highlight that our system in its old design was structurally racist and it's generating the outcomes it was designed to generate. So moving on to com college completion rates, the red bar here is the white college completion rate, Hispanics at the yellow, black at the gray, and the Asians are up there on top and they're really dark. I think it's gray or black, I don't know. But you see consistently, look at that gap in college completion rates between whites, Latinos, and African Americans. And look how consistent, stubbornly consistent, that gap is over time. If our educational system was actually creating equitable opportunity for every student irrespective of their race, you wouldn't see stubborn, consistent gaps like that in college completion. You have a report in your packet on higher ed funding and, and higher ed outcomes in Illinois. Please look at it. The breakdowns by race, by income are compelling we need to do a better job of ensuring all our kids at least graduated high school, college, or career ready because what the data are telling us is completing a college education is more crucial than ever to being viable in the modern economy. So let's look at some of the economic data points. This is unemployment by race over time. And look at this. From 1968 to 2018, the red line is the unemployment rate for blacks. Every single year, it is higher than the unemployment rate for every other group. Period. End of story. Every year. If discrimination weren't impacting labor markets, if public systems weren't structurally racist in how they provided access to opportunity and learning opportunities and education, you would see a far more random distribution of unemployment rates and you would see no statistically meaningful correlation between race and unemployment. That's not what you see in the data. Consistent, over time, every single year, the African American unemployment rate is greater than the white or Latino rate. So we tried to look at earnings for your typical white worker and see how African Americans, Latinos, Asians compared. And, and your, your typical African American or black male worker earns 71 cents on the dollar for your average white worker. Latino, it's 72 cents. Asians actually earn more than whites, $1.19. But you look at where the discrimination has singled out black and brown folks in education for years. If, if the data and all the data show you that educational attainment is crucial for being competitive in the modern economy as an individual these days, for being qualified for a high paying good benefit job. And by educational attainment, I really mean post high school. You need a certificate or a degree to really be in that cohort of workers that are seeing their incomes increase at a rate greater than inflation. If we really had equal access to those opportunities since we first started desegregating education after Brown versus Board, we wouldn't see outcomes like this. But connecting the dots, we have a structurally racist education system and that is denying the credentialing black and brown individuals need to be competitive for high bang good benefit jobs in the modern economy, and that is showing up consistently in the data. So now we're looking at median household income, and it's just in 2018, it's also in 2018 dollars, but it's just in 2018. And you can see that white median household income today is significantly greater than black or Hispanic. Asian income even a little better than that. But look at this. This is wealth by household. White, black, Hispanic. 
And the numbers up there are, are typographical error, errors, actually, but the lines in the graph are accurate. Today, the average net worth of white Americans is about 4.6 times greater than the average African American and 6.6 .6 times greater than the average Latino. That white line, that's the growth in wealth for the average American white family. And drop way down that scale and look at it for blacks and Latinos. And tell me there's not something structurally flawed in the system. All right, so not surprisingly then, home ownership very much favors white families over everyone else. The yellow line at the top is some white family home ownership. As a percentage, it's over 70%. Whereas for black and brown families, it's under 50%. For, for Latinos, it's approaching just 40%. So home ownership, which is a real indicia of, of having adequate resources to really make ends meet, clearly disparate along racial lines. Poverty by race, again, you see the same disparities. A much greater percentage of the African-American population lives in poverty than does the Hispanic, white, or Asian, consistently over time every year consistently over time every year. And then a, a much greater percentage of Hispanic workers and black workers work for wages that are paid at a poverty level than the percentage of white workers who have poverty level wages. Final data is incarceration rates, and this is white, black, and I, you know, <laughs> There's been so much written about this, I just felt like we had to include at least one slide on it. But it really doesn't matter what you look at. Healthcare, housing, education, economic viability. You see statistically significant differentials between white families on the one hand and black and brown families on the other over time. And you see that these differentials are reinforced by public structures on everything from funding access to early childhood, K-12 and higher ed, to housing programs, to economic developments over time. So that these public systems, which were really intended to create the level playing field for all families of all races, of all incomes, are structurally flawed, and structurally flawed in a racist way. Where I will leave you is, is sort of what inspires me and many of us at the center to come to work every day. In fact, we talk about this, the American dream. And really, what is the American dream? And we actually have discussions in our conference room about what it means to us. And at least the way I look at it is in America, the circumstances of an individual's birth shouldn't limit what that individual can do with her or his life. Shouldn't matter what your income level is, it shouldn't matter what your race is, it shouldn't matter what your gender is, it shouldn't matter your ethnicity, your religion, it shouldn't matter. This is America. You should have access to maximizing your potential in this country. And what the data are telling us is the American reality is nowhere near the American dream. We need to address this, and we need to address it thoughtfully and in a manner designed to fix these systems' flaws so we could move closer to what that American ideal should be, and that's the challenge. I thank you for listening to this data, and I'm gonna call up now our moderator, Laura Washington, who pleaded with me to keep her intro and bio short. So I guess she probably didn't want me to mention her many awards, including Chicago Emmys and the Studs Terkel Award for Com Community Journalism. She probably didn't want all that. So I'm just gonna pull out one thing from her resume that makes her the ideal moderator for today's deb debate. And she was the editor and publisher of the Chicago Reporter doing work on racial matters for a significant portion of her journalistic career. This is a subject she knows, she's written on, and she's passionate about. And with that, I will bring up Laura Washington.
Thank you, Ralph, for following orders. I appreciate that. <laughs> and thank you for that uh, really excellent uh, foundation that you've laid of research and data, very profound. I think some undeniable patterns there that hopefully will sort of get underneath a little bit more in our conversation today. Uh, thanks for having me for this very important conversation. We don't talk about race nearly enough. We don't talk about race, racial equities, racial justice nearly enough, and we need to talk about it a lot more. So it's really important that you're hosting this program today. And I'm pleased also to be able to say I've worked with Ralph in the center for many, many years as a journalist. Um, you have, you've got the best research in town when it comes to issues not only of, of race and racial justice, but of uh, budgeting and finance and education equity and a host of other things. So um, it's great to be here. I'm also pleased and honored to be able to introduce our stellar panel. I'd like to ask them to step up to the stage now <clears throat> so we can get this show on the road. Uh, there's background information about them in your uh, packets, so I'm not going to go into great detail with, about their bios because I'm sure they're going to share a lot of the work that they do uh, with all of you. And we're looking forward to having a very deep and rich, and I, I would probably call it a Chicago Tonight kind of conversation up here today about a very complex but a very important subject. <clears throat> I'll start uh, on my immediate left with U.S. Representative Robin Kelly, who hails from the Illinois 2nd District, which spans Chicago's South Side, the southern suburbs, and beyond. Since her election in 2013, she has worked to expand economic opportunity, community wellness, and public safety across the state by working on numerous initiatives to generate job growth, reduce health disparities, and gun violence. Welcome, Representative Kelly. Next to her is Representative Will Davis, who represents the 30th Illinois Legislative District in Chicago's South Suburbs. His top legislative priorities have been education funding, increased health care availability, and economic development. In 2017, Representative Davis was the chief house sponsor of SB 1947, the evidence-based funding model for school funding reform. <laughs> Representative Karina Villa is from uh, the 49th District of Illinois, and she is a lifelong resident of that community. The first term legislator is an advocate for schools and families and community service. She's been a school social worker and served in the West Chicago and Villa Park school systems. And all the way from California, we have Mike Honda, who's a third generation American of Japanese ancestry based in Northern California, where he served as a congressman from 2001 to 2017. He also has Chicago roots, having attended Chicago elementary schools on the city's north side and in Hyde Park before he, his family returned to San Jose. He has collaborated with Ralph, as Ralph mentioned, and the center on the issue of equity funding in public education. So I've asked uh, each, or we've asked each panelist to, to kick it off with a few, to speak for a few minutes about the work you do and how it intersects with race and public policy. And if there's anything you want to react to in terms of what you saw from Ralph, we, we welcome that as well. I'll start with you, Robin. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And thanks, all of you, for being here. I'm also on the board of CTBA, so I'm glad to see uh, so many people here today. And thank you, Ralph, and your staff for everything that you guys do. Um, there's so many things going on um, in my mind about what I should say, but um, when I look at um, what you presented, uh, I'm not surprised, but it's, it's sad that it's still going on. Uh, but I'm gonna talk about um, like my biggest issue that I'm working on, unfortunately, still is the whole gun violence piece. And coming into Congress, what always stood out to me, but I think I've changed it some, that we only spoke about the mass shootings. We never talked about the everyday shootings, which were more black and brown people. I mean, um, I used to, I had to get up and speak to my colleagues in the Dem Caucus. I remember this clearly, it was after Pulse, and we talked for like a half hour about the mass shootings and all of that, and then I got up and said, you know, the night before Pulse happened, one, young woman was killed, and we haven't mentioned one word around her. And a lot of times we find that the individual shootings are the black and brown people that are um, dying or um, being maimed for life. 
and I see it in grants that are awarded and things like that. It's like the rich get richer. We don't look at the smaller organizations. There's a lot of good organizations in Chicago that are small but need to be scaled up, but they don't get the money because they don't have the grant writers or they don't have a, a big staff. So I see it, you know, that's just a piece that mm -hmm. I see it in um, where I think um, race does intersect with politics, but there's so many things, um, especially in this climate. Right now. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the, the, the gun issue because I hadn't thought about it that way. We do focus on the, the nationally recognized, and in many ways that ch cheapens, the, cheapens the deaths and the, and the casualties that happen on a day-to-day -day basis in, in our And there's much more of those casualties than the mass shootings. They all count. I'm not saying that. Sure. But, um, and, and also, I think uh, when we look at individual, it, it's the face the, the our biases come into play when it comes to individual shootings and where they're happening at. And the bias leans toward what? Like, it leans against. <laughs> or leans against, leans against right. people. Like we don't right. seem that mm -hmm. we um, care enough, you know, about that. And, mm -hmm. and a, a real quick example, I'm totally for background checks, 110 percent. But what I keep saying, well, in areas like Chicago, we need trafficking, mm -hmm. and that hasn't gotten the the play yet. It's the, and I know we only, I mean, we can barely get that passed with Mitch McConnell, but, um, but there's other things that are needed. It's not just one thing. Um, but when you look at what gets passed or what people get passionate behind, mm -hmm. it, it, again, it leans toward the mass. Absolutely. Thank you. Representative Davis. Oh, thank you again for allowing me to be here. Certainly thank to, thanks to Ralph and CTBA for all of their hard work. Uh, and tough work on ident identifying particularly those issues related to structural racism as they exist in, in just about every sector that we can talk about uh, from the state government uh, uh, perspective. So I think what I at least like to make sure I emphasize with this group is that the data is real. It's, it's true. I mean, these gaps exist no matter how you try to dissect it, no matter how you try to massage it, whatever the case may be, it's real. And as a long-term legislator, and I've been in the General Assembly now for 17 years, a lot of what we continue to do is still has to involve the conversation of race. And at some point you would think that, that we get it, so to speak, but unfortunately we don't get it. Um, and, and, and I hate to, to emphasize upstate versus downstate, you know, needless to say, when I say it that way, that my colleagues that are still kind of downstate Illinois seem to be kind of stuck in a world that has moved on beyond, you know, where we were from the 1960s, but it seems like some of the attitudes, their pervasive attitudes seem to still be stuck in that time frame. Let's, let's move on. I mean, I, I do a lot of work um, not only with education funding, and, and again, we've talked about that, Ralph has talked about that, so you know kind of where that is, and when we still have to say that uh, the quality of, an edu of a child's education should not be predicated on where they live, you know, it should be equal, it should be, it should be open, they should have access to, to everything, I mean, it's, it's, it's true. And, and, and we're evolving in a way that suggests that we're still trying to figure out ways to create the separation. So I, I had the pleasure of doing the City Club uh, uh, last week um, with Advance Illinois. And one of the questions that came up from the audience talked about the idea of moving away from uh, physical test scores and grade point averages as a way to evaluate young people. You know, is that, is that the direction that we need to go? And, and my answer to that was, well, when the, and I, and I hate to use the, the phrase leveling the playing field, but when the playing field becomes level and all kids have access to the same things and the quality of education across the board is the same, sure, we can move away from that. Um, but while we still have these gaps, it's, it's difficult to embrace that because what that would mean that for those young people that have access to the greatest quality of education and all the technology and everything that exists, um, you know, you're still leaving some students behind, but that makes those that are making those decisions about not looking at test scores, makes it even more subjective for them because they'll say, well, those kids, you know, we can't really evaluate them because they don't have versus the kids that, that, that do have something. So until we are ready to have a real conversation about leveling 
you know, and I hate that phrase because it always implies taking something from someone. But until we're ready to have that real conversation about it, we, we have to keep looking at what we do in the context of race. Uh, 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 another thing that I work on in Springfield is supplier diversity. Um, acknowledging that in our contracting in the state, we're spending millions and billions of dollars, and yet our spend with diverse groups is still like one, two percent overall. It's terrible. And not only in state government contracting, but we're starting to dabble into the private sector contracting for those sectors that intersect with the state, utility companies, hospitals. I mean, our hospitals are terrible at their diverse spending. You know, they're building huge facilities, hundreds of millions of dollars and one, two, three percent in terms of their overall spend. So now I'm taking my conversation the next level into schools, you know, because we have school districts who are building, building, spending hundreds of millions of dollars. And my guess is that when we start to dive into those statistics, it's going to be the same. So, uh, you know, when we have to still keep trying to figure out how to bring equity to the conversation, we know that we still have challenges. Absolutely, as, as, as we already heard from the, from the presentation, maybe that's another uh, research project for, this, for Ralph to, to look into some of those budgets. Yes, absolutely. Representative Villa. Thank you. So um, before I held the title of state representative, I held the title of Miss VS, school social worker, and I would say that the most prestigious and beloved of the titles is the latter in my heart. Mm -hmm. um, as a school social worker for 15 years, the first 10 years of my career, if someone would have said, Karina, you're going to one day be a state representative, I would have laughed at them because I love the micro practice that I, that I did on a daily basis, walking down the halls and uh, hearing my students uh, say Miss Via and come running up to give me a hug after a long summer break was one of my favorite things in, in the world. Um, so I worked in the, a school district that was uh, the poorest school district in DuPage County, which was West Chicago. Um, and it, through that practice, I can tell you with uh, certainty that what we saw on the slides today is in fact true. Uh, we were one of the school districts that um, benefited greatly from, from the result of the, the hard work that, that Ralph and his team did and, and the state reps that, that were before me. Uh, did to, to have the equi uh, equitable funding formula passed. So um, I eventually ran for, for school board and saw what, um, what an impact um, it, it, it had to have a, a voice of a person of color on, on the school board that represented majority uh, uh, Latino students. Um, it's, it's a problem when you look at a school board and, and you see that it doesn't look like the, the students that it represents. Uh, when you don't have a seat at the table, you don't have a, a, a voice at the table. And, um, and so um, I think that, that representation at all levels is really critical. Um, moving on to being a state representative, uh, one of the things that I've learned from my leaders um, from the Black and Latino Caucus is asking some of these really critical questions of, um, you know, how many people do you have working for you that are uh, black or brown, right? Like how many, um, when, when people come to me, I realize the voice and the power of the voice that I have. It's, uh, it's pretty, pretty impactful. Um, so, so those are some things that just as a, to, to kind of start, um, those are some impressions. Great. Mike Honda. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> first, let me thank um, the university for opening up this place. I'd like to matriculate uh, in the next uh, mm -hmm. go around. Um, to Ralph, thank you for um, spearheading this whole concept of systems of analysis and uh, rethinking and looking at the data to drive ourselves to create the policy. On a personal basis, um, the way I came to this idea of equity versus equality from all children to each and every child has been a series of uh, points in my life where it was um, recognizing a problem and saying, uh-oh, then hearing a possible solution and saying, aha, and then figuring out where I go from here is wow. So those three things uh, have been pretty important in my life, but to remember them was more important. First one was um, the war in uh, 1941 and being incarcerated by a country that's supposed to protect us uh, for all of our rights and then having to fight for 
a uh, resolution apology and reparations uh, at the uh, legal level and uh, congressional level and, and getting that, that taught me that we had to speak up. And then after that, I got involved after Peace Corps with two psychiatrists, a fellow by the name of Price Cobbs and William Greer, two black psychiatrists who wrote uh, a book called um, about black youngsters and why they have so many problems in their lives. And listening to that and reading that and being trained with them sort of made me reflect upon my own past and started to uh, understand what Price Cobbs and William Greer meant when they said, you have to take yourself and disintegrate your personality and your life and then reintegrate it in a way that it's gonna be healthy so that you can come out healthy also. I think that process has been going on ever since then with myself. So when I ran into um, Ralph, uh, that was another point of aha, uh, where he had this group um, that did this kind of analysis on budget and um, um, what was it called? Budget and tax, that's it. Mm -hmm. the congressmen don't understand the word tax. <laughs> And, and, and it sort of pulled all these things together, and I started to understand that uh, there needs to be um, a systems analysis of what we're doing on a daily basis relative to kids. And then when I read the materials to prepare for today, the, the, the term structural racism sort of rung out there because when I grew up, we used to call it institutionalized racism which meant that all our systems have been built uh, by people who ran the country. Now, public education does not have one genesis. It has many. Start from the colonial times, but who set up the schools? White, free, wealthy, or money people for their children, and then the other kids came in. So those other kids had to conform to the expectation of those who had been the architect of our system, the public education. And it goes on, on even today. We have never really learned about our own public school system because no one ever taught us. And I'm not sure whether there's a real good course on how to understand the system that we have today and why it doesn't address the youngsters that we want to address today. And so we had architects and the structure all in place, and now what we have to do is start to disintegrate and disaggregate our system, then rebuild it and replace the beams, the structure that was put in there based upon the old architects' ideas of what they wanted to have in schools, and look at our whole population of youngsters. And it's not gonna be easy. It's not gonna be cheap. But then the old bumper sticker says, what's the price of ignorance? And so uh, to Mr. Davis and his bill, uh, SB 1947, mm -hmm. uh, and the evidence-based model is the step towards equity in education for each and every child based upon their personal needs. And when we can do that on a national level for each and every child, I don't think we have to worry about income, zip code, uh, parents' in uh, parents' income, and all the other things that seem to um, drive in this current situation a, a child's future in education because the educational system is not set up for that. And so we have to really revamp it, really look at it. It's a national security uh, issue, and in my mind, when we said separate but equal was unconstitutional and the 14th Amendment said, you're right, there's equal protection for anybody and everybody in this country, so it should be a civil rights for each and every child based upon the 14th Amendment. And we gotta get busy and start working towards each and every child. What do you mean by, you just said it's a national security issue, what do you mean by that? Well, people say that our youngsters are our future and therefore our national security. And if that's true, which I think it is, 
um, then we should pay attention to it and make sure that we move towards it. And when we say, well, it's gonna cost a lot of money, it's gonna cost a lot of staff. Yes, that's what we've been working for. Appropriate staff for each child's needs and the cost of it. Now, when this country went into doldrums back in 08, we were broke. We had trillions of dollars of debt. But in a couple of years, we had the money to do it. Mm -hmm. Where did that money come from? Well, from Congress, I think we print our own money. <laughs> but we found a need, and we moved forward as a country saying that we need to solve this problem. And what we have to do is have every person, whether they're parents, grandparents, or not parents, that we look at each and every child as our responsibility and the issue of both civil rights and national security. Robin Kelly, did you want to no, no, add something? When you asked me about national security, it just made me think, as I go around and I speak to my employers, uh, they're scared to death. They're not going to have the qualified individuals to take over the jobs that are now and in the future. And some of them are really around national security and those kind of things. But I mean, I'm getting the complaints now from employers uh, that are really worried about who's, who's going to be the workforce because of uh, people not being qualified or they can't find people with um, technical acumen, uh, and it's not necessarily, I know we like everybody to go to college, but it's not even that everyone needs to go to college, but they're just having a hard time finding people. And I hear that all over, no matter where I go, my district is urban, suburban, and sure. rural. So um, I hear it from, you know, all parts. So it's national security because of what's going to happen mm -hmm. to us, and mm -hmm. then it's national security because of as we move you know, deeper into the 21st century when you think about technical things or cybersecurity and those kind of things, so in a big way and a small sure. way, too. And what, what is your response to those employers when, when they bring these issues up? Well, one thing, um, I think that a lot of our, and I, I won't say a lot, some of our young people don't even know what's out there for them. So I challenge my employers to get involved with uh, younger uh, students in elementary school, don't even wait until high school to let them know what the possibilities are and to um, be more involved with the schools. Some are, but mm -hmm. a lot are not. But some feel like the schools aren't welcoming also to them. Like some have told me they've had, you know, internships available and the school never sent yeah. anybody, you mm -hmm. know, and things like that. And it's also working with the parents, you know, which that's, that could be difficult also. And, and, and just, to, just to push this a little bit further, are, are there overtones of race to some of these conversations that you're having? Or is, and I don't want to presume that, but are there presumptions that some of these young people are not qualified because? Well, on the other hand, people have uh, shared with me that they know a lot of people looking for jobs, but they don't seem to be able to you know, get hired. Because and um, you know, a lot of people think, and I hate when people say it, but it's the who you know, mm -hmm. you know, I don't have a connection or I don't have this, that, and the other. So some people feel like no people are qualified or, or we will give um, a white female or male a chance where we won't give a black or brown young person a chance or they don't have the mentoring or the internship or the apprenticeship and those kind of things. And that's why I know the Congressional Black Caucus and the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, we raise a lot of money every year so we can bring in mm -hmm. you know, interns and fellows mm -hmm. to give them that chance. And then also, we've made a very big stink. So they're paying a lot. Of, in fact, a new office was created, um, an Office of Diversity in the House, so that um, younger black and brown uh, folks have, can get hired mm -hmm. on the Hill. Because if you look, yeah, it's pretty white, right out there, huh? Right. <laughs> what a surprise. Well, Will it, Davis. It's, it's interesting when Robin was talking about, you know, employers needing people, but we still have a fight getting black and brown people into the unions. Mm -hmm. it's still there, you know. So they're not as welcoming. They're, they aren't changing as much as they talk. They're not changing as fast as they as they should. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you talk about some of these employers, they say, well, you got to go onto our websites. Have you ever tried to navigate one of the websites of one of these employers? Mm -hmm. It's terrible. 
You, you think know, by design? I think so. Mm -hmm. I think so. So they're talking a good game mm -hmm. because they know that on the state and maybe even the federal level, there are monies available for them to do this. So they're trying to make sure they get the resources, but they're still not changing the way that they, that they should. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody's talking about this. You know, we need employers. You know, our workforce is aging out. You know, our young white kids aren't coming into these technical things. They aren't coming. They don't want to get their hands dirty. And we're saying, okay, well, there are plenty of black and brown kids that might be willing to do this, but they're not as aggressive, I think, as Robin is saying, in going out and trying to find it. And, mm -hmm. and when she talks about their inability, say, to get into a school, I think there's still some trust issues mm -hmm. that they aren't really working hard to try to overcome so that the schools would be welcoming. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're talking a lot, particularly at the state level, about vocational education. Well, this is part and parcel to it. Um, and we're going to continue to talk about it because it's kind of the latest, greatest, if you will, in terms of our young people. But until the companies, until the corporations really start to break down some of the things that have been in place to try to prevent black and brown kids from accessing these opportunities, right. we're still going to be talking about the shortage, you know, probably for the next five or ten years when there are things that can be done now immediately to improve it, mm -hmm. to talk to our young people, whether it's in elementary school, about what the future is, but more importantly about the, the challenges that they're facing now um, in terms of getting employees. I mean, these young people are fantastic with their hands. Mm -hmm. They're smart, they're intuitive. You know, college may not necessarily be the thing for them, for them to get to where they want to go in life. But yet, we still haven't been able to bridge right. that gap. We're continuing to beat that drum, but again, just still the fact that we're having trouble still getting mm -hmm. young people into the unions, again. Mm -hmm. you, the, your point about young people working with their hands, I think it's an important one. We sometimes don't think about the assets of the people we're trying to support and help in the community that, in a different way than sort of the traditional way in, in, in up, li lifting up those assets and skills in a different way. Absolutely. Representative Villa? So my district actually doesn't look like me or those on the panel. Um, the district I represent is um, pr primarily Caucasian. and. Um, you know, it's really interesting because I have the, the in, in a state district, a state rep district, I have the most manufacturer companies in one state rep district in the state of Illinois. And you would think that that would then equate to having manufacturing conversations and programs within the high schools in my district. That's just not the case. Um, and I do believe that part of that has to do with um, we want to focus more on promoting the elite students. We want to focus on promoting, um, you know, making sure all of the students are in the advanced classes um, versus looking at the needs of other students that might not be heading towards a four-year degree. Um, and, and so that's, it's just an interesting concept to me, one that I've um, tasked my education advisory committee um, with, with discussing, with having mm -hmm. these conversations of why are we not providing access to our students and educating them from freshman year, uh, you know, um, to, to, to let them know that it's not only college, that they can also get uh, different careers in, in the technical industry. We've been talking a lot about the challenges around um, public policy and, and moving these important policies forward. But are there opportunities when we talk about race and we focus on race that, that you've, have there been opportunities that you've had in your work, maybe in a policy that you've been able to advance or think, get people to think about differently because of the racial component? I, Mike Honda, I think I had, saw your hand up. Did you want to address yeah, that? I, I think one of the things as policymakers and as parents and as folks who have dreams about kids is we have to really be careful on how we use terminologies. Mm -hmm. Terminology seems to be the beams that creates the structure, and if we have the wrong people having <clears throat> the wrong notion about what race means or what equity means versus equality versus parity, we may not build a structure that's going to be appropriate for youngsters. Uh, the New York, um, there's a bunch of uh, TV ads that says uh, they're, they're working on the segregation issue, and the phrase in there was, advantaged parents don't have to give up anything for equality, is what I think. But they're, they're saying, what does an advantaged parent have to give up to, uh, to realize um, desegregation in our schools? 
And I, I'd say that, you know, advantaged parents don't have to give up anything for equality, uh, but they have to support the concept and the principle and get behind the concept, principle of equity for each and every child. So that would include their own children when we talk about educating our youngsters. So terminology is very important, and I think how we, how we use the terminology, how we build policy around it, it's going to be important. And so when we talk about school funding, we talk about equality, but the equality comes out in the form of ADA, which is average daily attendance. Well, for children who are preschool and the eighth grade and anybody who enters in uh, our school system not prepared, equality doesn't mean a thing because the issue of equity has not been addressed for them. The equity meaning that they have all the resources that was put to bear so that we can address their needs for their preparation to be able to compete on a platform of equality. So youngsters approaching the school system that's equal, but ill-prepared, not the lack of ability, but ill-prepared, is going to not, it's not gonna have the same kind of um, gratifying um, experience in the public education system. Terminology and how we look at it and how it's used in building our system is gonna be important. That's why uh, this, this build evidence-based is one of the basic uh, terms that I think we need to look at when we start to look at funding each every, every child in our school system. It doesn't happen overnight, but to struggle to rethink and reevaluate and redefine our terms in, in the context of public schools. Yeah, you make a great point about terminology. Some term, terminology is offensive and a turn off. Like I was talking to Ralph when we were preparing for this program about the term white privilege, and that's kind of a dynamite term that. Can, can people stop listening sometimes when you hear that. So it's about how we talk about the, these, these issues and how do we talk about them in a way that brings people in and, instead of repelling them. I think that's such a good point because I remember when I was a state rep, and I cannot think of our colleague's name, but um, it was always about you want to take, he was north, you want to take something away from me um, to bring your schools up, you want to bring my schools down. I can't think of his name, but that was always his, um, mm -hmm. You know, his response, I don't want to give up the great things I have, which of course, why would you sure. want to do that? And we kept trying to explain, no, we don't want to bring you down, but we want to bring ourselves up. But it just never seemed, maybe we weren't using the right terminology, it just never seemed to penetrate. The other thing um, that I wanted to talk about, when we talk about um, being equitable and resources and those kind of things, I, I don't want us to also forget uh, about the people that we're training to run our schools or to be our teachers also, mm -hmm. because uh, that's a concern. I hear a lot from people, the, the, uh, let's say in some of our area, we get the newest teachers and they get some experience and then they leave. So we're constantly getting the newer teachers and then they leave when they're more experienced. And what's, what's that about? What, what, why is that happening? I don't know. Is it? What's the? <laughs> there, there are some. Uh, pay, I mean, there's some there system to it. Yeah. yeah I'm pay, sorry. The what? Pay gaps. Pay gaps. Pay gaps. That exist and part of our effort in the funding reform bill and some some legislation that's come subsequent to that has been looking at ways to try to level it out so it's not necessarily more advantageous to go work in the North Shore versus it is versus South Suburbs or or downstate, and, but those bills seem to meet resistance as well, particularly when we're talking about teachers. So is that the age old idea that you know we, we love our teachers but we just don't want to pay them mm -hmm. to, to educate our, our, our young people? But um, that's inherent in some of this conversation because certain areas of the state just pay more. And unfortunately, those areas that pay more happen to be the wealthier areas. Uh, of the state. Pay more and have more. And have more. Yeah. The, the, it's you know, structural, again, it's getting back to exactly. Ralph's, Ralph's again, point. Again, that's why this conversation is, is again, so very important. Mm -hmm. And again, I can't say enough about CTBA who's willing to take on the conversation about structural racism. Mm -hmm. And it's just inherent in everything that we do. I mean, if you really pay attention to the data that comes out of this organization, when Ralph talks about it a, a lot, you can see that if we make certain changes, you know, changes that he advocates for, that I advocate for, 
you know, where we can at least from a money perspective make sure that the dollars are equal across the board mm -hmm. um, so that we have the opportunity on the social service side to, to make sure that we're putting the right dollars and building up. And, and the thing about social services is that a lot of people think it's about continuing to allow people to live in a certain manner, you know, just give them a little bit to just continue to live. I think we believe that the idea of that is to a, recognize where some didn't have and figure out ways to bring up a population of people so that we all can start moving together um, uh, moving together as one. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at the dollars that we spend in the correction system, um, that kind of illustrates it. You know, we're still spending more and more money to incarcerate people um, and less and less money to try to give them opportunities to better themselves, better their, better their families. But when we talk about decreasing the corrections budget, mm -hmm. it's a huge fight. Yeah. You know, it becomes a, a huge fight, which I'm sure you probably have written many, many stories about and, and studied as well. But that fight just illustrates the fact that downstate Illinois, which is predominantly white, and in a lot of areas, you know, they're fighting to keep those prisons, but sure. those prisons are populated by people of color who are coming from the north. Um, you know, Sean Ford uh, always has a bill about counting inmates from the areas that they are from, mm -hmm. um, as it relates to census and other things. So uh, that other they get things like that, get you know, because if they're just say temporary residents, mm -hmm. because we're supposed to be re rehabilitating and sending back then why not allow those areas where they're going to go back to to receive the monies to help sustain them when they return back from those facilities. But because it's a money situation and though they want those dollars to stay in downstate Illinois, they want the numbers to stay high because they want to, that's economic development mm -hmm. for them, you know, it just becomes, one again, a classic fight of, again, entrenched structural racism that exists in state government. Right. Well, and right here in Cook County, we're having this debate around incarceration because of the push to depopulate Cook County, uh, the Cook County Jail and to get people out on, on minor offenses mm -hmm. and get them out on bond. And that's created a, a real firestorm, I think, that really has a strong racial component. There's a lot of fear out there about letting people of color out of, out of jail mm -hmm. that may be violent. And that's, right. so that's another, another and, talking and, point. And we, can, and we can structure that conversation when we talk about like job opportunities for mm -hmm. ex-offenders. You know, these companies, you know, say, well, we don't want to hire ex-offenders. I mean, the reality is that it should be on a case-by-case -case basis mm -hmm. because let's understand the circumstances under which someone may have wound up in the system that that doesn't define who they are as a person. They still have value. They can still contribute. And again, if we're talking about companies who need people, sure. then here's a population of people who can work, who want to raise. They're not, they're not in jail. They didn't commit crimes, many didn't commit crimes because it's just innate in them. They were put in situations that kind of maybe forced them to do something that they didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. Maybe they were trying to feed their families, mm -hmm. themselves. So we, can, we have the ability to acknowledge that and to, and to create a system that allows for you know, individuals like that to come out, uh, receive the same type of training that we're offering everyone else and create the same opportunities for them. But again, we just can't seem to get past that in order to make that happen. But the bottom line is if we do nothing, then they will remain, they will go back to jail. Right. Yeah. And they'll and remain criminals. And, and, and there are a lot of costs associated with that for all of us. Representative Pia? Yeah, it's just so, this conversation, it's like so cyclical and it's all compounding because mm -hmm. you look at the slides of how many um, Latinos and blacks go to college and start and how many graduate, right? So when you're looking for black teachers to come and because you, you want students to be able to walk into their classroom and to have someone teaching them that looks like them, right? It's important, it's relevant, it's critical. Um, and, and when you have um, teachers that don't look like you, then it's, it's different. It brings a different flavor. Um, and I know that to, to be true. I, I, I was a school social worker to a group of uh, young black boys, and I so many times would cry tears of frustration because I wanted role models for these boys that looked like them. All of these boys came from households that didn't have their fathers because they were incarcerated, right? So it's, it's all cyclical, it's all compounding. We need to invest in education. My parents are, uh, I'm raised by Republicans, right? Uh, it's the greatest thing to say at the doors, by the way, um, when I'm knocking and asking for votes. Um, so, you know, it, it, the thing that we always come back to, we have in-depth conversation and arguments, and, and at the end of the day, we always agree on the same thing, always. Invest in education. Invest in education. 
that and if, if at, at the end of an argument with my mom or my dad, I want to I, I wanna just say, okay, let's just have a peaceful end to this conversation, I just change the conversation to education because they agree 100% without a doubt that we have to invest in education for our students in order to decrease crime, decrease uh, you know, mortality, decrease uh, health issues, decrease you know, our, our, our environmental issues. Like we, all, we agree that investing in education is number one. Well, that's a great point, and it, it leads me to my question. You know, how do we get out of this cycle? What strategies have, all, have you all used as legislators and advocates to get us past these, you know, the cyclical conversation about race or, or you know, hitting the wall every time we try to advocate for people of color? Will Davis? I, I continue to challenge my members. I mean, you will often see me leave my side of the floor go over to the Republican side of the floor to a member and get in their face and say, what, what's going on? What are, what are you doing? You know, you, you want money to come to downstate areas, your areas, but you don't want to take the vote to get the money, so to speak. I mean, I, I do that often, and I think that's part of it that needs to happen. And if I'm the only member that's willing to do it, so be it, I'll go do it. But I often am challenging my members, whether it's going to them directly and having a face-to-face -face conversation with them, or when I have the opportunity to speak on a piece of legislation, bringing it up. I remember in latter days of session this year, one of my uh, white female colleagues on the Republican side, we, I think we were talking about something relative to higher education, and she started out her speech by saying, no offense taken, no offense. And I had to respond, offense taken. Mm -hmm. And then we started from there, you know, because again, I, I feel that in part, it's my responsibility to bring that to their attention, to at least say it to them. Right. Uh, however they internalize it and deal with it, uh, you know, whatever, but I'm going to have the conversation with you. Have you had any success with that? Is there anything, any example you can point to where you, you broke through and well, some, had a success? Some members are willing to make minimal acknowledgments um, relative to that, but some no. And, yeah. and again, one of my earlier comments about particularly my downstate members is that they're just kind of stuck. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't know if it's really about the constituencies that they represent and they themselves want to be more progressive, but they fear like they feel like they can't be more progressive. But many of them are just those areas are just kind of stuck in a way of thinking that just, you know, signifies, um, you know, the way things were several, you know, 40 years ago, if you will, 50, 60 years ago versus the way things are now and the way that we need to start thinking of things, and I'm just of the opinion, fine, you don't want to support, you know, overall these efforts, then, you know, why should you, then it becomes a money issue for me yeah. when we talk about budgets and allocating resources, because we're trying to make sure that we raise up the state. I mean, ironically enough, the Le Illinois Legislative Black Caucus is actually one of the most diverse caucuses that exist in the Illinois General Assembly. While we're all black members, we represent Lake County, we mm -hmm. represent Rockford, Peoria, Metro East, City of Chicago, and suburban areas. So we are all over the state. And we have to deal with the politics that mm -hmm. exist in all of our regions. Well, that can be, and and that can be a those, positive thing, too, in yeah, terms of you bring those, those to the area. So uh -huh. some of our downstate members are you know, dealing with these. But I just feel that in any situation, if you can stand up and justify it, it doesn't mean we have to agree, mm -hmm. but you should be able to stand up point it out and say, yes, I'm going to support this issue because it's the right thing to do. It helps some of my residents, maybe not all, but it does help some of my residents. Right. And just stand up for that. I, I, just, I just believe in what I call the dialogue. And if we can have the mm -hmm. conversation. Having a real conversation like you used Having earlier. a real conversation. Uh, Mike Honda, did you, successful yeah. strategies uh, that you've used to advance. Some of the call. strategies I've learned was um, understand who you're opponent is or who the person on the other side is. And in California, we wanted to pass this special ed bill that the Republican governor was going to veto. So we had to figure out how we're going to get this person to understand what the bill is all about and how it helps youngsters. And so understanding that, we asked ourselves, who does he know that have youngsters that have special needs? And we found a law partner, and the law partner spoke to the governor, and he signed a bill. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. finding people who understand, who are cohorts of the other side, is, is, is pretty powerful. 
without slamming them and um, telling them they're stupid and stuff like that, but find something that uh, they Personal can resonate connection. with. And when they signed the reparation bill for the Japanese Americans in 1988, we heard that Reagan was going to veto it <clears throat> because there was some resistance to it. But we remembered through a, a um, person who was Reagan's, uh, Captain Reagan's uh, um, helper, I guess the charge, what's the French term for your assistant? He ran with uh, Captain Reagan when Reagan had the duty to go to the parents whose son had died in combat. Mm -hmm. And his assistant happened to be Japanese American. And after one visit to a Japanese American elderly couple who lost their son in battle, he said to his assistant, Reagan said, if there's anything you ever need, just call. When he became president and this came up, he remembered that. Ah. So he called in that chit mm -hmm. and he signed a bill. But I think you know, he can see the, the um, the purpose of our effort to have our children educated. And that's why I think the uh, evidence-based model doesn't speak to class. I mean, doesn't speak to separation of youngsters. It talks about evidence that comes for every child. And I suspect that every child needs to be assessed whether, uh, regardless of the zip code. And that's a powerful argument in saying that advantaged parents also have children who have needs may not as much as some other children, but they may have needs and that should be addressed. That's a powerful statement for any parent, regardless of their um, standing. And equity is a concept I think most people can understand right. versus equality. Mm -hmm. You need to get there first before you can compete on equal footing. Right. Right. So I commend your, your bill and I want Californians to do it. <laughs> going to work on that. Robin Kelly? We're going I'm to. Smiling, because I always say, believe it or not, uh, in D.C., Honda will back me up. We get along better than it looks. I know it's hard to believe, <laughs> but I work in a very bipartisan manner. And in fact, I was able to pass a dental bill um, that deals with uh, oral services. I know David Miller's back there smiling. But um, that deals with oral services for low income, for rural, for seniors, for veterans. And the reason I could pass that bill, this is when we were in the minority, is because there are five dentists, maybe more now, um, in the House, and they're all mm. Republican. So they helped me pass mm. uh, the bill. But right now, for us, I've tried to go across and talk about, you know, uh, gun violence, maternal mortality, where too many women are dying, 700 to 900 a year. Black women are dying four to one times the rate in Illinois, six to one times the rate. Uh, Native women in uh, Washington, D.C., Washington, the state, eight times the rate of white women. I could not get one Republican to sign on, and it's clearly, if you're a person of color, um, a lot more dangerous to have a baby. It's more dangerous, period, than it was 25 years ago for any woman, but for women of color. And uh, even though they had a, like a step one bill that we signed on to to make it bipartisan, mm -hmm. they won't sign on to this. And it is clearly. And, it's, a, and is that just because they see it as a democratic issue? And, or, and, and, I, and they, but it and, wasn't a democratic and, issue when their person mm -hmm. passed the first part of it, you know, mm -hmm. and we joined on. So, you know, I'm not sure. But yeah. um, now, um, and people talk, and I do something every year that I do in the South Suburbs, diversity dinners with Democrats and Republicans, just to get to know each other and those kind of things. But right now, there's such a level of fear, even if they think to me that we're right about some things, they still won't, um, on some issues, uh, vote for those issues. And that fear is based on what? I think the guy in the White House, mm -hmm. for one. And, um, uh, and uh, yeah, I think it's that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that. Um, You're afraid that they'll be singled afraid, out. Yeah. And, and also, it could be some, I don't even know if it's because of where they represent, because some of the people are surprising. Like you, I mean, it, um, it's not all white that you represent, but you still don't want to, um, I guess, looking at their base. But um, so we have worked together. People have worked together. I've been helped you know, by it. But also now, 
more so to me is you know overwhelming that um, it's just really people hard don't, to, yeah. to, to, to yeah. talk across the, across the aisle. Mike Hyman? One of the strategy points I, I think would be money and budget and um, the so uh, CTBA is a bipartisan uh, group which was a powerful argument in our, uh, in our commission because um, Ralph was bringing up other points that we didn't think about or we didn't want to address because it was the other side. Mm -hmm. But under uh, Mr. Davis's uh, bill, the, I think that one of the things they're looking at is how do you get the budget to a point where you can afford to do the things that we need to do for the youngsters? And he alluded to the fact that if you do something in criminal justice and do it right, you can redirect that money in other areas so that the children can be benefited from it. The other one is, there was a graph in our handouts that showed how the, how the state, of Cal state of Illinois can address their, their structured deficit where they can pay it, off, pay it down over time and get to a point where their pension can be in a certain place and their budget can be in a certain place. And it was pretty creative where you pass a bond for a temporary to cover the cost, rising cost of getting to a point where you can afford to be able to pay on an annual basis the deficit and then the debt later on. Mm -hmm. But looking at a budget and how you, how you turn that into a tool to be able to effect the kinds of things you want to do, the issue about money uh, is important, but you can address it in a way that people can understand and you can, you can demonstrate it on paper. Mm -hmm and you can demonstrate the progress of youngsters in a public education over time, but you have to be able to set it up so that people can see it, and not just a small you know, annual uh, effort to balance the budget, but also to look at the budget in a long-term basis. So I think, and is uh, it another issue, costs? If you don't, it's like, you, and this comes up a lot in the, car, in the incarceration conversation, if you don't do something to address this problem, is there's gonna be a bigger cost down the road for taxpayers or for constituents as well. Sure. Those costs are gonna to get to the point where they're just eating up more and more of even the stuff that they like, so mm -hmm. to speak. And, you know, my Republican colleagues in particular, it's gonna start eating away, um, eating away at that. I mean, we've been, you know, Ralph and I recently met with the deputy governor to, to, re, to re pitch, because Ralph did it during the transition, but just to be a part of the conversation about you know changing the the whole pension conversation mm -hmm. and unfortunately this administration just doesn't seem to you know want to you know really follow a, a good plan to help be able to over a period of time redirect monies back to the things that you know where we spend the majority of our dollars at four out of five ralph health education public safety you know economic development percent like, there we go. So, I mean, the, the data is there. As much as we talk about data, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. there that yeah. suggests that if we yeah. make these changes, we can do all of these things that we want to do. Now, mm -hmm. yeah, we're going to continue, presumably, to continue to fund education, but we know we've got to shore up some other areas. CTBA has a plan, but for whatever reason, this administration, if anybody out there knows Governor Pritzker, have a conversation mm -hmm. with him. There's a plan out here to help redirect those dollars appropriately, but we can't seem to any, get any, them th any theories about what, what the problem is, what the, what the challenge is there? Well, I mean, I would, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ralph, but when we met with Dan, Dan seems to get it. Dan Hines. And this is the guy that he brought on mm -hmm. to lead that sector of mm -hmm. his government, if you will. His deputy governor gets it. We hope that he's talking to the governor uh, about these kinds of changes. Because mm -hmm. again, if, we, if we're not ultimately making those changes, A, our deficit is gonna get bigger and bigger. It's gonna be almost insurmountable at some point. But again, the more it grows, the less money we have to redirect toward education funding, toward social mm -hmm. programs, our, our own public safety. You know, we're just gonna get to a point where we're just never gonna be able to catch up. I right. mean, it's already grown enough over the last couple of years, right. Right. sizably, but. Okay. I want, Representative Vila, did you want to, Vila, you want to say something? To go back to the previous question um, with, uh, you know, Leader Davis, I think that um, his, his uh, statement minimized the impact that he has um, really in, in Springfield. And to me personally, he has always been a mentor. And I, and I sit back and I listen to what he has to say. And I, I sit back and, and there's times that I've gone up to him and said, 
you know, I'm angry about this or, or you know, explain this thing to me. And, and he always takes the time to, to um, process with me and, and help me understand. Um, I think that as, um, as a state representative, it's really critical to, um, to, to listen and to also understand um, so my perspective for my district is very dis different than what um, Leader Davis is or others might be. So he does a wonderful job not just reaching across the aisle and helping others on the other side of the aisle understand, but also on our side of the aisle. There, there's quite a few um, people who might not take into consideration um, people of color when they're making their decision. And I, I really commend Leader Davis with, for, for all of his work. So um, that, but also the, the other point I wanted to make, I just want to reiterate, is the representation at all levels. We need, you know, if we're in Springfield and I'm there with my Latino caucus members and we're really excited about what we're doing and I go back to my district and I have no support because everyone is on the other side of the aisle and, you know, people are, you know, whether it's uh, city government or mm. school board or uh, park district, um, if, if I don't have allies uh, back home, it, it really makes my job very difficult. So um, just making sure that we have representation at all levels is just really critical. Yeah, well, as a person you mentioned before that you're, you're representing a mostly white district, mm -hmm. as a person of color, is, is, does that present special challenges for you when you, when you go back home? And do you have many so, other people of color as allies in, in, in elected positions and government in your community? So the, the thing that is the most, um, I, I would say that the, the most challenging is just uh, the interesting uh, perspective from people looking at me and, and thinking, well, how did you win that seat? <laughs> um, and I know that I've had conversation with my good friend, Congresswoman Lauren Underwood, uh, because she represents uh, the same kind of district as, as myself. And, um, you know, her and I have had long conversations about, about that question. And um, the, the beautiful thing is, is that I know that she is the best person for that seat, and I know that I am the best person for my seat, so. <laughs> but, but actually, that's happening more and more because it's Lauren Underwood, but mm -hmm. um, Johanna Hayes is the first um, black person to represent Connecticut. Uh, Ayanna Presley coming out of Boston, right. so we see it, you know, uh, which is a good feeling. We see that more and more because, I mean, the uh, uh, Congressional Black Caucus grew to 55 members, and we represent, you know, New York to California, Minnesota to Mississippi, you know, so, and all points in between. So, um, but we're seeing it more and more that people are representing districts that may not look just like them, mm -hmm. which is encouraging. And that probably has a lot to do with demographic shifts and just the, 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 mm -hmm. the increasing diversity in the, in the country mm -hmm. at large. Mike Hanna. Yeah, there's a, the, 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 there's a demo, uh, demographic uh, population we haven't talked about, and that's our young people. The young people in Florida changed the gun, gun laws, and they were also saw themselves as future clients or future victims that they want to avoid being victims. And they made a big point of it uh, on climate change, got the young people out there in the UN making their statement on a public level. And I, I think some of our policymakers need to hear mm -hmm. in a very clear voice from our young people to say, this is the right path to take. In the old days, in the 60s, there was a phrase in Oakland that said, each one reach one, each one preach one, and each one uh, teach one. And I think this is about teaching our colleagues, and sometimes it's gonna take the young people to help us understand and listen very clearly what it is that we're trying to do on their behalf. And if they take ownership of these concepts, um, I think they will be a great uh, catalyst for us to be able to achieve the kinds of things that Mr. Davis wants that we want to see for all of our children, so. And, and they have been catalysts, uh, as you say, on, on the issue of gun, gun violence, on, on Black Lives Matter and other uh, women's rights. But one of, the, one of the tropes out there about young people is they don't stick with it. They don't have the staying power. They show up, but then they're not, they don't show up at the polls when they necessarily need to. I don't know if that's a trope or not, but um, I know, Robin, you wanted to respond to something he said, but if there's uh, thoughts about that as well. When you, I agree, we should listen to the young people, but, um, but also the other thing is, if you um, speak to some of the young people that have been in the gun violence prevention space here, um, they're resentful because black 
young people have been speaking about it for a long mm -hmm. time, and they didn't get listened to, but when Parkland happened, you know, yeah. different demographic, wealthier, whiter, then all of a sudden, oh, you know, look at this, look at what these young people have been doing. But there have been many, um, you know, black young people trying to do it, you know, for a long time, and they did not get listened to. But to Parkland's credit, they reached out to definitely mm -hmm. the black young people here, because I've been with them. The Parkland folks did. Parkland uh -huh. folks have been mm -hmm. here. The people here have been to the homes in Parkland. They've been in D.C. together, you know, they've traveled together, but they're, you know, but people, young black people have said that to me, wow, we've been, you know, screaming. And one of the Parkland kids, I said, you know, what did you think about Chicago before this happened to you? He said, I didn't even think about Chicago. Mm -hmm. And he said, but now um, I think about it all the time because we had a moment and theirs is a life, you know, like a life. They live with this every single day. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm glad that the you know, the young people see each other, sure, I guess. Right. When I'm, like there's good kids in Mad City and Chicago and in Baltimore. So there have been kids speaking up about that issue for a long time, but they did not get the audience or the recognition until part. Other people want to respond to that? You know, I mean, how do we, I mean, is it, is it, are, is there staying power with young people? How do, how do you as legislators, how can we help them get to the next level and help them keep these issues out there? And because I think that they, have a, because of who they are, they have a much more powerful voice than maybe some of the other demographics. We're starting a, a youth cabinet. Um, mm -hmm. uh, urban, suburban, and rural has its, it's tough having a district like that, getting you know people like to have one group, so you might have to have two groups, we're not sure. But just to encourage uh, younger people to get involved, stay involved. Um, I have, um, I really push interning in DC. I have, you know, mentors from NIU, uh, where I got one of my degrees from. So, um, and I, I think um, listening to them and providing, you know, the opportunities so uh, their voices can be heard. But, you know, more young people got elected this time, so let's, mm -hmm. let's see what happens, what they can do. you know, you know, with that, yeah. I mean, I try to get in the schools as much as I can. Mm -hmm. Make, uh, I'm can. a full-time legislator. So I'm always available, you know, I try to be in front of young people so they can, so some of it is demystifying this elected official who's up here and whoever, whoever they think they are, how they view us. Um, you know, I, I represent the community that I grew up in. So that's a connection that I have with young people, particularly in the city of Harvey, uh, where I grew up and I just try to be in front of them as much as possible any opportunity to speak to young people, to engage the young people. You know, when we have groups that come to Springfield, I often find myself missing committee because I've got a group of young people who are there and I want to take them onto the house floor. I want them to see the chamber and just show them it and have some real dialogue with them and allow them to ask questions about what they saw that day, if they were in committee or on the floor, understanding the dynamics of how this debate went and what they, what they took away from it and what they thought it meant, but then also challenge them about ways to uh, invoke good public policy. You know, a lot of what we do is not something I think of, it's what comes from the people we represent. And encouraging them to think about those things that are impacting them or their families or their schools or whatever, and then try to figure out ways to turn it into, you know, ideas about public policy and share those ideas. You know, if nothing else, just making sure they know who their state rep is, who's yeah, your state absolutely. senator. You know, uh, ask that question sometimes, say, who's your state rep? And they go, Robin Kelly. I'm like, oh, <laughs> no, not Robin. You know, she's you gotta your, work on that one. <laughs> rep, you know, yeah. but just getting them yeah. to, to dig a little, a little deeper. And then, of course, I, I use um, um, uh, one of my, uh, you know, she's, she's kind of a captive volunteer, you know, like forced to do it a little bit is my uh, eight-year-old daughter, Jana, who <laughs> travels a lot with me, you know, and goes places. And, you know, I've been to her school a couple times just so, you know, her peers can make the connection. So to Making speak, it real about, for them. Yeah. Make, it, make it real for them. So just taking those opportunities. And then, you know, and I, I'd like to acknowledge her, uh, Dr. Hall, who's sitting in the audience there, who was a former school board member out a little further south than me, but she worked a lot to try to bring kids into the dialogue about mm -hmm. politics and what does that mean and what have you. So, you know, mm -hmm. having folks like her out there and others, I try to connect with school board members a lot as well. Bring, invite me into your schools, invite yeah. me to those meetings, 
you know, you're having these in, uh, uh, events that involve young people, allow us to be a part of it, you know, mm -hmm. not necessarily for our own political gain, but so we can make those connections and mm -hmm. encourage young people to start thinking about ways to change public policy in positive ways versus, you know, having all that pent up frustration and anger, mm -hmm. like on the gun, gun policy side of it, because some of us, they think nobody will listen to them. Right. Nobody sure. wants to listen to them, sure. but there are people out there that will. I want to ask one last question before we take questions from you, but I want to remind you that you should have gotten some cards when you came in, and if you have questions for the panel, please uh, bring them to the end of the aisle there, and I'll be taking a look at them shortly and sharing them. Um, so we kind of touched on this a little bit. What do you all need as legislators and advocates to help you advance these issues better, more effectively? Um, obviously, you know, you have constituents, you have, but there's constituents in the room, there's public policy folks, research people. What, what's the one thing that maybe that you're not getting enough of or that you need more of uh, to help you do your job better and to be more effective? I wonder you should ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I've noticed as a, as a legislator is that when you look at the academic institutions that are doing research, many of those institutions don't have avenues to bring their ideas forward. So the, the teacher shortage conversation is something I've been a part of. I had the pleasure of going out to Seattle uh, with a group, and it was a national conversation about teacher shortage. And you got all these, uh, you got K through 12 folks, the higher ed folks together talking about ways to fix it. There were only three legislators there because some of that is going to be public policy changes. So I liken them to like frustrated artists. You know, they've got all this talent, they've got everything, but it's all bottled up and they don't know how to get it out. Yeah. Um, because when their university presidents, at least on the state side, come to Springfield, the only thing they're really talking about is money and budgets. They're not talking about policy changes in whatever sector, maybe that school is good in education. They're not bringing forward what their education department is suggesting or mm -hmm. talking about. So we've got to figure out how to bridge the gap to get more from the academia right. side toward you know, giving it to legislators to introduce to, or at least have dialogue about it. You know? is, that, is that about maybe find, finding new relationships in, in, within institutions that go, go beyond the usual suspects that have a, have a vested it, interest in a particular it, policy? Or? Well, I think it's, it's some of that, but also, you know, again, everybody has a state legislator. Mm -hmm. Are they talking to their own state legislators mm -hmm. about this policy change? that they like to see happen. They'll, they'll bring the data, they'll bring the research, and say this is a great idea. Now, of course, every legislator doesn't embrace sometimes what's brought to them, but at least start there at the very least. But then, you know, you can look and see who's on what committees we have through our, our, our site. So if I've got an interest, let me go find the right committee, hear all the legislators on it, both Democrat and Republican, and start talking to them. Say, hey, you know, this is something that I think your committee should look at. And again, we have the ability um, to use subject matter hearings as a way to draw out you know, right. policy conversation as well, where it's not, you got to vote on it right away, right. but let's start a dialogue mm -hmm. about it, maybe have a subject matter uh, hearing on it, and at least start the conversation moving forward. Great strategies. Robin? I'd laugh as my first thought was to vote some of these folks out, but that's what I need. <laughs> but, um, well, that's so, one strategy. <laughs> but, but, um, the other thing is, I don't know if it's working more with the media or in a different way or social media, but it seems like, um, and some of my staff is in the audience, no matter what we do or no matter how hard we think we worked on something, the amount of people that say, I didn't know that, you know, or how come I didn't know, or, 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 or people, maybe it's just our nature, or to wait until, uh, not the 11th hour, but one minute to 12 to say, no, I don't like that. Like mm -hmm. how, um, even if we do, like we've done little Congress on your corner or coffee mm -hmm. with your congressperson or, you know, all of those things. And some people come out, but not, you know, the masses. But then I hear, well, we haven't heard from you. Well, I tried, mm -hmm. you know, so right. just, I don't know. New, st new strategies yeah, to, to what, communicate yeah. and market to your right. constituents and to get the word out. Some people, yeah. that's always the way it's going to be until it really hits them. Mm -hmm. They're not going to pay, you know, as much attention. But yeah, in some way, um, or even, I guess, it, 
keep trying to touch as many people as possible, mm -hmm. then they'll touch those people. You know, um, like almost like ambassadors for us. Do, do you have a, a robust social social media strategy? Your office does you spend? My office does. Yeah. I am uh, back <laughs> in the uh, 19th century. <laughs> no, we, yeah, we do yeah, social media. We tweet. That seems to be the, um, the future. Facebook, you know, web, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, but, but also, I have parts of my district that. Um, it's hard for them to get on the internet yeah. because they don't have the services. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, so I um, agree with, with what was already said. Um, I think that um, quality versus quantity in terms of bills, um, I, I would like to see a really strong data-driven research-based policy. Uh, that's something that I would really um, like to see myself focusing on moving forward instead of just, um, you know, let's present 15 bills and see if I can pass five and, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, th that make a, a minor impact. Um, I would like to move towards uh, just real solid um, legislation that has research behind it. So more of what CTBA is doing, uh, more research, more data, more folks out there who can give you the ammunition to, to move bills forward. Absolutely. My conduct. So um, between uh, CBTA and um, SB 1947, is there anticipated that children would be assessed in order to um, accrue the evidence in order for you to be able to track the progress of schools and then fund them? Is that is that the? Want to support it? Basically saying, well, you want to give all this money out. How do we make sure it's going into the right places, it's being used appropriately? Right. So there are mechanisms to take deeper dives into school districts to make sure through our State Board of Education that the money is being uh, spent and used appropriately. Yeah. It, it seems to me that um, based on the assessments that schools will be doing for the youngsters in order to get the funding also, is that the assessments should be able to give some indication of what are the future and present needs of teacher curricula, teacher preparation curricula. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, a, a, a goal mine that's not being talked about or, is, or maybe it's anticipated, but it seems to me that teacher preparation institutions might want to look at redesigning themselves around that so that we're not te training teachers to teach on issues that, were, that we were taught. It's like parenting as we were parented and not ever evolving into a better parent. So that seems to be one um, treasure for uh, teacher preparation and curricula. And I, I guess the other is, um, if we can do that, then we can look at the increased funds in the future where we can start to not only prepare teachers to be teachers, but uh, be able to provide them uh, compensation that's professional because mm -hmm. you're, you're rearranging the budget based upon this approach uh, there should be more and it, you'll be investing more in education so I think it may in some ways solve a couple of problems that we face as uh, a nation teacher preparation um, and also um, um, the, the uh, compensation of the profession and It'll raise their um, not only their um, income, but also raise their level of um, professionalism and also the level of appreciation by the community. Because in my house, if I did something wrong, and the teacher told my parents, I not only got punished at school, man, I got more at home. Mm -hmm. So I, I think uh, bringing this home and looking at the the possibility of the future that. The bill is uh, proposing uh, seems to be a gold mine. Thank you. So we've got a lot of great questions up here. You some smart people in the room. I want to pick up on what, you, what we, we were just discussing. This question is: I agree with Congressman Honda. There needs to be an education piece around the difference between equity and equality. My question, once informed, is: There the political will to provide the funding that equity requires? And before you, you, uh, one of you takes that on, I want to ask you to speak more clearly into your mic. Some folks are having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. So if your mic's maybe not positioned right, 
So anyway, the question is, you know, is there the political will out there for, to provide the funding that we, that's required in, in Springfield and in, in, in Congress? Well, in Congress, we spend, I think the bill this year, $733 million on defense and then 500 on everything else. And yes, there are um, some people that would vote to change that. And we have a great leader, Bobby Scott, on education and labor, but we have another side that it's not, you know, hmm. Mitch McConnell is um, who we have to deal with, and he has, you know, the power and the control. So we can do everything we can do in the House, but that is not going to happen in the Senate, not right now. No, maybe the political will needs to be about changing Congress, that's changing that, the composition of Congress that, to make that happen. Why, that's why okay. I said what I said. Yeah. Uh, well, Davis, I, political I am, will? I am <laughs> always glass half full kind of guy. Um, we've been fortunate enough um, to have at least put in a minimum of 300 to 350 million dollars in new dollars into our new funding formula. Um, but what we're recognizing, and I think Ralph had a slide up that talked about really the gap is about 6.6 ish billion. So we know we've got some significant ground that we have to make up. So I've engaged Dan Hines, uh, Jesse Ruiz, the Deputy Governor in Education, as well as even meeting with the governor that now would be the time to really step up the investment. And uh, at the City Club, it was, I think it was referred to as the billion dollar question. Mm -hmm. Well, the question is, can we put a billion new dollars in one year into education? I think that we can. I, I truly think that we can. I think this is the year that we can do that. Now, mind you, it may go against a little bit of what Ralph was saying, meaning we got to find the money to do it. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I just believe if we can figure out through a capital bill how to f spend $800 million on one road. So if anybody takes I-80, I mm -hmm. guess you'll be pleased in the next year or so. I-80 is going to be the- $800 million dollars are going into the reconstruction or- Reconstruction of I-80, I-80, I think adding a lane further to the west, and then the reconstruction of the bridge over that river. Uh, $800 million, they wanted a billion, but actually it was reduced to $800 million. So if we can figure that out, I've got to believe that we can figure out, again, if we all agree that education is that most important thing, that we can figure out, and even in maybe not the best of budgetary times, but if we can figure that $800 million out, mm -hmm. we can figure out a billion dollars in, uh, in new education dollars. So I think that's where we need to be headed uh, with trying to bring that equity that um, someone mentioned and, and talk about uh, closing those gaps in a major way. I meant to say also $733 billion on military and then $500 billion. No billion, right, million. right. Representative Fee, did you want to say anything? Um, I, I think that I'm just right there with, with Will that I, I too believe that we have the political will in Springfield to do this. I am cautiously optimistic, however, because the money has to come from somewhere. And I think that we have to really make sure that this heavy lift of the fair tax um, in November 2020, that we get that passed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we have to take a realistic approach to what's happening with our pensions. So there's, uh, I don't want to just say yes, absolutely, without also ta taking into consideration all of the other um, pieces that are coming into play. Okay. How can we address the student debt crisis, which is another place that has great racial disparities? What policy changes are needed? Student debt crisis. One thing I just want to remind this audience, captive audience, is filling out the census is extremely important. Cook County was one of the worst during the last census, so we lost millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars, and some of that was health care, some of it was uh, student loan issues and uh, roads, road issues. We are gonna lose $1,400 per person for 10 years for everyone that does not fill out the census, so that's a lot of money, so it's really, really important that you do it. Everybody counts whether you're in prison, as we've talked about, whether you're homeless, whether you're undocumented, we, we have to get those numbers in us. We will lose more and then um, the student loan or, or will suffer also. But we need to, with uh, student debt also, and we tried to do it when uh, Mike was um, still in Congress to change the interest rates, but we, mm -hmm. we were in the minority, we couldn't get it done. 
I, I would probably just add to that, there's a lot of conversation, particularly in Springfield, about what I'll call free, edu free college, free education. I mean, if we are figuring out how to provide it where somebody doesn't have to quote unquote find the money to pay for, then that will certainly uh, have an impact on, on student debt issues in the future. And then I think through working with Congress and others, you know, they can probably have more impact on some of the current crises that exist. But uh, free education is just one of those things that we are talking about now um, that will certainly have an impact on, on that in the future. I think that it's a conversation that needs to be had often, um, and it needs to be at the forefront of people's minds. People my age um, having thoughts of committing suicide because of their outstanding debt is unacceptable, and, and it, it, it's unacceptable that, that we don't bring this, the urgency of this conversation uh, to the forefront of many conversations. The federal government in some way was responsible for the demise of our banking and our home ownership. It was fraud. Student loans became a business and they started charging interest. To me, that was a fraud. How we got out of the financial crisis was get help from the Federal Reserve. They lent banks money almost at 0% or one, less than 1%. Why don't we just go to the Federal Reserve and offer these youngsters a very, very low interest so that they can pay off their, their debt and, um, and not have these uh, enormous uh, interest placed upon them and maybe even mm. reevaluate the, their debt and take out the, uh, the percentages that were imposed upon them based upon um, this business concept because uh, they were taken advantage of and it looked good. So, you know, I think it's a way to right a wrong and I think that it's, it's going to take bold action. But if we believe that these youngsters have been screwed, that we should do something about it. Uh, the, this is another one, uh, and this relates to something you brought up earlier, Mike Honda. The, the data are compelling. Racism is structural. And of course, this is not a recent phenomenon. It raises the question of reparations, which we have done for Japanese Americans. What form should reparations take? And I assume the question was asking about reparations for African Americans, but that's the question. What form should reparations take? Mike Honda, you wanted to jump on? Well, I, th I think the charts that we saw today really reflect the need for uh, reparations. Reparations does not only have to be money, but it can come in a form that's going to cost money. And I think that that's something that we should open up and put on the table, like uh, education. And moving forward, as a nation, uh, based upon evidence-based uh, funding, and we can, uh, if we take this and adopt it at a federal level, uh, what kinds of changes can we really see? Because the federal level doesn't have to balance the budget as the 50 states have to. It's within that balancing budget um, box that the states find themselves. They got to get some help from the feds, and I think this is part and parcel of what we call reparations. And it should drive down that data mm -hmm. so that there's more equity and that there's more opportunities and that we address the real substance of the foundation of this institutionalized race, racism that we have in struggling. And when the young people come out and say that this is true and you know, African-American kids say, hey, we've been struggling with this for a long time, it's the realization that all this time we bought into this and now we understand it, so we should be collaborating together and becoming uh, you know, one force together, understanding really what the real foundation is that they move forward. Okay, I want to just pause here a minute. Can, can you folks hear better now? Or do, do we need, need to be, okay, great. Okay, well, just, Davis? Just very, very quickly, there will be a conversation in Springfield about reparations. Um, right now there's one uh, being initiated, I believe Alderman Sawyer is taking the lead on it in the city council. Um, between myself and Senator Maddie Hunter, we will be having a dialogue about reparations in Springfield. There was some conversation about it in Springfield several years ago. There's a new or renewed interest in, in talking about it again. A gentleman named Dr. Willie Wilson 
who has really been pushing that, you know, pushing that for the last several weeks, um, is working, and I believe he's going to be trying to work with the federal government at some point to talk about it again, particularly for African Americans. So there will be a conversation probably in the spring from the Illinois General Assembly yep. about reparations. And when you said conversation, is there, are there going to be hearings? Is there, is there a bill that's going to be proposed? There, there or will be, there will be something stay? filed. I don't know if it's going to be substantive bill, a, a resolution bill, so we can, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure what form it's going to take mm -hmm. for us, um, but there will be something filed in, in the spring. And then whether it's either way, we'll be able to have hearings on it. Mm -hmm. and, and talk about what that looks like in state government versus other sectors. Of is, there any, uh, is there any um, push toward a particular structure or uh, strategy at this point? Is there, is there a conversation around a particular way of doing reparations at this point, or is it still too early? Well, again, the, the reality is that, at least based on my experiences in state government, we, we talk about what would otherwise be things that could be viewed as reparations. Again, we talk about um, uh, uh, particular like education. You know, we want to provide, we think we should be providing free education. Um, we think we should provide, be providing free health care. So again, those are separate issues that talk about providing, you know, something at no cost to right. individuals in some ways. Or, um, so, so we talk about it in different silos, but I think it'll start to come under the umbrella of what we might call reparations uh, at some point. And we're going to look at it across the board in contracting. You know, why do uh, diverse contractors have so much trouble trying to get contracts? Are we going to get to the point where we're mo more or less doing set-asides, which sometimes may be deemed to be a, a, a discriminatory in that respect, or at least a shot down by the courts. But we're going to, we, we want to have that kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a tough conversation, but uh, we're, we're going to have it. We have, of course, Sheila Jackson Lee's bill in the House, which did have uh, a hearing um, not too, too long ago. I, I can't remember. Um, maybe a couple months ago mm -hmm. there was a hearing. So, um, and hers is really studying it. And as she always says, it doesn't mean, you know, writing a check and giving it to you, you know, but looking at education and different things like that. But the, the bill would call for a study specifically of, of possible right, options what, right, as opposed to actual, an actual mm -hmm. form of reparations. Okay. These two are related. Um, have vocational education programs disappeared from Illinois school systems? And if so, what impact has that had on employment opportunities for non-college bound students? And what can be done at the state and federal level to support public schools in pursuing more school to career programs? We do not recognize, incentivize, or reward schools for pursuing needed school career options went to one of my, uh, it's the Kankakee uh, Work Center, and um, they have three shifts of kids that come in, and they, come, they go to their regular high schools, and then they come there for two hours every day, and it's either law enforcement, fire, cosmetology, welding, uh, IT, I think graphic arts, I'm, I'm missing something. So there are, and, and the program's fantastic, and they mm -hmm. have fantastic stories. I'm all for bringing back um, vocational education in whatever form um, that the state <laughs> feels like they can uh, bring it back in. And they've talked about the kids that at least don't want to go to college now and they graduate because they've had, you know, opportunities in high school and making, you know, for an 18 year old, I think he said $45,000, you know, uh, uh, where they work. So I, I think they have disappeared, but I think that uh, we need to bring them back. My brother went to a vocational high school in New York, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I, I think they're very important. And what is he doing? Now he works for the post office. But <laughs> <laughs> That's good. But, That's a good uh, job. Yeah, That's no. That's a good job. Right, he's getting ready to mm -hmm. retire, actually. Mm -hmm. But um, so I definitely believe we should do whatever we can to bring uh, vocational education back, whether it's in the school or the kids leave like some of them do now and do what we can do to work with our uh, community colleges. There, there is a paradigm shift taking place relative to the career side of college and career readiness, uh, if you will. So we do have some uh, high schools that have CTE programs. Uh, the funding, there is some state funding available for CTE programs. It's probably focused more downstate and it is upstate into like the work centers that Robin just spoke of because all of the counties have them. Cook County probably doesn't do as good a job with that. 
Um, but what we see um, happening is there, because this is a, a growing conversation, what you'll probably see, at least in the south suburbs where I am, the development of what we're going to call a regional uh, career center. Uh, we know there are examples of it in various, again, other counties, and I think there's going to be an effort to try to put something like that in the south suburbs to just create the balance for those mm -hmm. students who are not or don't desire to go to a four-year institution, but again, want to graduate, get some training, get some skills, and go out and find a job. And it fits into what we talked about earlier with, you know, those companies that claim, you know, that they are in, in need of people. And some, we're going we're gonna to give them all the people they can handle, so to speak, so we can revitalize our, our manufacturing sectors, uh, reinvigorate uh, the, the building trades. Um, so it, it's coming. So again, there's that, a resurgence. Yeah, they're, 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 we, are, we are definitely working on that. Great. Anybody else on this question? OK. Um, Congressman Kelly mentioned, Laura, mentioned oh, I'm sorry, Mike, go ahead. Can I respond to that? Sure. The, the response to, for me, in terms of uh, vocational ed is something that I'd be real cautious about because again, uh, we've been schooled into thinking that vocational ed means an alternative to uh, the streamlined education and we have to not forget that we want these youngsters to have certain skills and these youngsters can learn these skills because um, we've been looking at ways to accommodate kids who are dropping out and things like that, so we're patchworking our public school system. You know, public school systems are formalized uh, in this country because of St. Clair Lewis when he wrote The Jungle. They found kids working, competing with adults, so they started formalizing public education to get the kids out of there and into uh, schools. So we train these kids from 6 to 16 in literacy, and they come out with a literacy of what, sixth grade at that time? Because that's what we needed for the workforce. And it was compulsory, but if a kid today doesn't get what they need, then it's like 10 years of determinate sentencing without any real outcome for that child. So I, I'd say we really have to look at the future, like artificial intelligence and what's gonna be out there. And we, we may even have to define what we mean by uh, vocational ed, rather just try to figure out what does a career look like in the future rather than the determine that based upon our experience in the past. So we have they, in this particular place, they do law enforcement, and I might be wrong, but I thought now you need two years of college for law enforcement, so it doesn't mean that they're not going to college, um, but it's just they're learning skills and learning about these different careers in high school. And they still go to their regular high school, but they leave and, and you know, do, are more exposed, I guess. Yeah, but given the outcome of a lot of police academies, which is mm -hmm. not standardized, we have to instill in the, the cadets uh, how you approach situations without using deadly force. And, We've seemed to go away from that, and we just teach them how to use the gun. I'm, I, I totally mean, agree, no with you. I'm, but I'm, also <laughs> we need to teach doctors and nurses, yeah. you know, how to deal with uh, women of color. So so many are not dying right, right. <laughs> when they give birth. Uh, uh, Congressman Kelly, you, you had mentioned that the Congress has established a division focused on diversity. Uh, does such an ex uh, does anything like that exist on the state level? And if not, are there any plans to create such? And it I also makes me think of uh, Lori Lightfoot's creation of, the, of an off, office, office of Racial Equity in Chicago, the first time there's ever been anything like that. Anything on the state level? Well, uh, right now, what, what we find is members, and I'm not the only member, there are a handful of us that are truly recognizing that uh, diversity uh, is truly important. Uh, we have a governor that you know, acknowledges the need for, uh, for diversity uh, all across uh, state government. I don't think we've gotten to the point where we're developing an office or, you know, a one person who's kind of, you know, job is to try to do that. I think there's some, I think I've heard that though, um, because again, where I think we're at a point where we fought it for so long. Now that we have a governor that is really embracing it, this may be an opportunity to set up some very specific things in state government. Uh, they kind of exist in a number of different areas. Mm -hmm. uh, a few different agencies really pay attention to it, but there's no one real collective effort uh, to try to do it across 
state government. So I'm not, not certainly not, a, not opposed to it, um, but you know, you'll see members that will continue to introduce uh, those types of pieces of le legislation, and, and many more members are, are talking about that now in a very uh, determinate kind of way. You know, it's not just a whisper conversation, what are we doing, but now really being vocal on it. And when they're meeting with the governor, when they're meeting with agency directors, they're asking very directed questions about their workforce and how they're spending their money um, with, uh, with diverse companies or in, particularly in communities of color. Karina Bill, did you Yeah, even, even within the Capitol, I mean, we have conversations all the time about how we would like to see increased numbers of staffers and um, making sure that, you know, on the House floor that we have people that look like us coming to, to the House floor and being on the House floor and giving them the opportunity to, to partake at that level as well. So the, um, I, I agree with, with Will, we, um, the, the Latino Caucus and the Black Caucus, I think, have this at the forefront of a lot of our conversations when we're, when we're, um, when we're in different spaces. What I was referring to was strictly around hiring. Hiring, yeah, hiring. That we established. And hiring on Capitol Hill in and Hiring on Capitol offices. Hill yeah. because we're, some people, they represent districts, there, are, there really is little diversity. So with, when you say you, know, you want someone familiar with that district, well, it's hard yeah. to have diversity. So people are changing that now. OK, this is a final question. Uh, Ralph noted that it will take over $7 billion to fully fund the evidence-based model. What are the chances that the legislature will fully fund that by 2037? So I might be a little bit, uh, I'm a, I'm a, well. A little, not not, well, the, not an optimist, optimistic question, but I know you're going to have a much more optimistic answer, right? Well, Robin just said, will I be there in 2037? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that'll be his latest. That, yeah, that, that'll be. Um, um, well, again, as Ralph and I have talked about, I'm, I'm very optimistic, but I just know that at some point we've got to make the real significant push mm -hmm. to get there. So um, does that mean starting to tie some of these other revenue generating issues to education funding? Karina mentioned the fair tax. Um, I brought that to the governor that that may be something that helps him to push fair tax right. because, again, if we all can galvanize around education, but we know that that's probably still a year or so out, so what do we do in the meantime? Again, I, I just believe that we can make a significant investment in K through 12 immediately, you know, beyond what we've been doing. And I'm not saying that that's bad, it's great, it's a good start for us, it gets us getting us rolling, but we know that in order to close that gap, and again, we, in the rea when we started, we said the gap was 3.5, which over 10 years, which is where we got the 350 million from. But even that number was the floor. We didn't know if it was between that one and somewhere in upwards of seven. So now that we've actually got the formula moving, the data suggests that it's now closer to about seven. Mm -hmm. And again, if we just keep trudging along, and that was one of the points of the City Club conversation last week, is that if we just kind of keep trudging along at that level, we're never going to get there, or at least, yeah, I'll just say never going to get there. So we know that there needs to be a significant investment for hopefully this upcoming budget year to show the commitment. Yes, we are committed to funding it appropriately, but again, starting to ramp up you know, those dollars and really start to close those equity gaps. We did a great thing with the formula, and we appreciate the congressman's uh, uh, conversation about it as he's learned about it being in California. I'm talking about it across the country. I've been uh, traveling with the National Conference of State Legislators to uh, part of a fellowship program for the last couple of years and we've been you know various points across the country and we're talking about it but here locally we know that the only way that we're really going to get there is we got to invest the money. We right. have to but invest there, the money. It sounds like there's a lot of energy and movement around it and that's, Absolutely. that's, always, that's always a good po positive thing. So I think we're going to wrap this up. I, I, I think Robin Kelly has to, to dash Catch off. A flight. It's been a flight. It's been a fabulous conversation. I want to add, thank all of our panel for your great words. I think, Ralph, you wanted to come up and say a few words? Brilliant. Well, first of all, I want to thank our moderator, Laura Washington. Please give her a big hand. Fantastic job.
I think everyone could understand why the center's been so honored to work with these elected officials over time. They're thoughtful, they're, they're, they want to move the ball forward, they really understand the issues, and they are working to create a better state and a better nation. We heard a lot today about the barriers, but I also share Representative Will Davis's hope for the future. You know, when we first pushed the evidence-based funding formula in Illinois, there was a lot of resistance to it, and some of it reared its head as racist resistance. I don't know if you remember that whole, this education bill is a Chicago bailout rhetoric. That was unapologetically racist. That, that rhetoric was highly effective in downstate, all white, all poor Illinois, and in affluent, all white suburban Illinois. Why? The message was, why should you pay more in taxes to educate those black and brown kids outside of your community? The way we countered that, and Will was a great leader on this going forward, was focusing on the evidence-based portion of the legislation. He said, wait a minute, Chicago bailout? This bill simply funds those educational practices which the evidence indicates actually work to enhance student achievement everywhere in the state. Don't you want to support investing taxpayer and money into those practices that work? It changed the conversation, made it safe to support it in areas that were worried, right? Helped us move the ball forward. You heard Will Davis point out that we currently spend our money well in Springfield, and it just has to be reiterated, 97 cents out of every dollar the state of Illinois is going to spend this year on public services goes to four things. Education, healthcare, social services, and public safety. 97 cents on the dollar. That's where we should be investing our money. The problem is we're not investing enough. We're not investing enough because we don't have adequate resources, which gets into how CTBA approaches its work. We look at these systems, we see where they're flawed, we identify the resources they need to implement the evidence-based practices that will actually make a difference in our communities and the lives of disadvantaged populations, and then we fight for it with our brave legislators that are here at the table. Hopefully you will all join us in this admission. You will support the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability. You will support legislators that are willing to have brave conversations on race and move this ball forward. And I look very much forward to working with all of you to creating a better tomorrow that's truly equitable across income, racial, and ethnic lines. Thank you very much for your support. <laughs>